Hello everyone, my name is Colin White. Um, I'm a volunteer at ScienceWorks and I'm also a member of the ScienceWorks, the Science Advisory Board. I also have another volunteer role with NASA and in this role I work with NASA to do outreach programs like this one. In this presentation um, I'm going to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope which will launch at some time hopefully in, in December if it stays on schedule. And the Webb Telescope is the largest space telescope ever built. And in this presentation, I'm going to look at the 50 year history um, of launching space telescopes and discuss how Webb builds on the experience of that 50 year history. I specifically want to look at how Webb compares to a space telescope we all know and love, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. So as I said in my introduction, uh, the US has been launching space telescopes now for over 50 years. The first successful uh, telescope to be launched was the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory in 1968. And in fact, that space telescope had 11 uh, telescopes on it that actually detected ultraviolet waves. And then 50 years later, hopefully at the very end of this year, we'll be launching the James Webb Space Telescope. So I'm going to look at the history over those 50 years, but I specifically want to look at why we launch telescopes in, into space. We have them on the ground. So what advantage do space telescopes have and how, and how do they help astronomers understand the universe and how it has evolved over time? So we use telescopes to understand the structure of the universe. Um, we have space telescopes like Hubble, shown on the right hand side here, but we also have telescopes on the ground. Uh, on the left hand side of this slide, we see um, ground based telescopes in, in Hawaii, on, on the island of Hawaii. And often uh, these two types of telescope work in conjunction with each other. Later on, we'll see some images where we combine uh, data from ground-based telescopes with space-based telescopes like the Hubble. Before we look at space telescopes in detail, it's useful to review the kind of objects astronomers look at to try and understand the universe. And I'm going to start off by looking at how some of these objects form, and specifically uh, on this slide, how stars evolve over time. So stars are formed from uh, clouds of gas and dust called nebula, and gravity compresses that gas and dust into protostars, proto which ultimately evolve into stars like our sun. Our sun has a, a fairly low mass, um, and so it takes the top route shown on this diagram. In the sun, we, we have hydrogen, uh, which is going through nuclear uh, fusion, it's being converted into, into uh, helium. And as the sun burns that hydrogen and cores, it expands into something called a red giant. Ultimately, though gravity wins out and the star gets compressed into a planetary nebula, and ultimately a very small, highly compact star called a white dwarf. The other route stars take is, is the bottom leg shown on this chart. Um, many stars have a much higher mass than our sun. So these high mass stars again uh, are converting uh, hydrogen into helium, but they're much bigger. They're called red supergiants. Ultimately, though, uh, gravity wins out and the star collapses and typically explodes into something called a supernova. And in fact, these supernova are so bright, they've over the centuries have been actually seen even from Earth. Um, what then happens after a supernova is that that evolves into um, a various kinds of objects, uh, black holes, neutron stars, which we'll look at in more detail as we go through this discussion. So astronomers look at various kinds of uh, astronomical objects. Uh, many of them are shown on this chart here. We've seen how uh, nebula uh, evolve into stars. 
And then stars are, are components of galaxies. So for example, our sun is a part of the Milky Way galaxy. And stars within galaxies often have planets. So if you think of our star, the sun, it has eight planets. And many other stars within the Milky Way galaxy um, have planets, and we tend to call those exoplanets. And as we'll see later on, many thousands of exoplanets have been discovered. And astronomers are interested if they have the kind of environments that would support life, very much like life on Earth, for example. We've seen how stars um, evolve into supernova uh, and then into neutron stars and black holes. And neutron stars, for example, um, create other things called pulsars. Uh, neutron stars have a lot of uh, magnetic energy and they spin. And as they spin, they pulse radio waves, uh, which we can detect on Earth. Uh, some supernova evolve into black holes. Um, and uh, these black holes um, actually often lead to the creation of, of quasars. They feed quasars. Quasars are very bright objects uh, that are actually fed from the activity from black holes. Over the next few slides, I'm going to show you some images of some of these astronomical objects. Many of them are taken using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the image here is of the Orion Nebula. That's a very well known nebula as part of the Orion constellation. Often, if you go out of the night time in, in the winter, you'll see Orion. You can see its belt and its sword. And in fact, in, in the sword is uh, the Orion Nebula. And it's a very popular uh, object to look at. Uh, you can take a, an amateur telescope on the ground and see it quite clearly. And in fact, you can see the nebula. And many amateurs like to take images um, of this nebula. This is a Hubble image of a protostar. As you can see here, we've, we've got gas and dust. And gravity works on that and compresses it. And, and ultimately, this protostar, as it forms, will evolve into a regular star. This picture is of a planetary nebula, which we've seen occurs towards the end of a life cycle of a star. This is the Eskimo planetary nebula. So this is a dying star. Ultimately, a star like our sun will collapse upon itself, form a very highly compact um, star. And then, um, as it does that, there will be various uh, gas and so on sort of uh, emitted. Ultimately, that gas will disperse and we get left with a white dwarf. Higher mass stars, um, as gravity works on them, will ultimately again collapse. But it, as they collapse, they explode into a supernova. And again, this is an example uh, of a supernova image created by the Hubble Space Telescope. We'll see later on that space telescopes capture uh, many different kinds of electromagnetic energy. Uh, this picture here is of a, from the Chandra X-ray space telescope. It captures X-rays, high energy X-rays. And these X-rays are being emitted by a neutron star. So this is a, an X-ray image um, of one of the astronomical objects that we've been discussing. So stars like our sun have planets. Um, the, our star, the sun, has eight planets like Earth and Venus and Jupiter and so on. But other stars in our uh, galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, also have planets. And in fact, um, stars in other galaxies also have planets. Uh, this slide here shows uh, a very famous and well-known system called TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1 is the sun, and orbiting that sun are seven uh, Earth-sized planets. And so there's a lot of interest in that. It's a, it's a, by, in astronomical terms, it's fairly close. It's 40 light years away. And on the left-hand side, we actually show uh, how space telescopes uh, find exoplanets. As the planet goes around the sun, or its sun, um, as it goes around the front of the sun facing the space telescope, there will be a slight dimming of the light. And you can see on the left hand side here, there are slight uh, 
breaks in the uh, brightness of the star um, as the planet orbits the sun called Trappist one and that's how we that's one method by which we find exoplanets I included this slide for fun um, NASA on the NASA website there's a section of the website called the exoplanet travel bureau um, where there are various artist illustrations of what an exoplanet may look like and what it may be like to live on an exoplanet in fact it's quite fun to sit back and think about what kinds of exoplanet you would like to, to go and visit and even potentially live on so in fact the one on the left is one of the Trappist one uh, earth-like planets or earth-like in size certainly we don't yet know if it has any ability to to support life uh, certainly has the kind of environment that particular uh, could possibly on the right hand side is an exoplanet you definitely don't want to visit it's it's a dead exoplanet so it's most probably not a very interesting one to go and visit so astronomical objects, as I've mentioned, uh, emit different kinds of radiation. Um, and we could think of that radiation covering a spectrum called the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so we have radio waves. Um, that's how we transmit radio signals, microwaves, which we, we cook with, for example. Infrared, our, the remote control for a TV, emits a, an infrared signal to change channels and so on. Um, as humans, the only electromagnetic energy we can see is visible light and that light um, goes from the red end of the spectrum to, to the blue end of the spectrum beyond visible light we, we get ultraviolet uh, we get x-rays and we get high energy gamma rays so we've got this broad spectrum of electromagnetic signals and astronomical objects emit various forms uh, of these kind of waves and that's what space telescopes and telescopes on the ground even detect i mentioned that uh, as humans we can only see visible light but it is interesting that some creatures on earth can actually see other kinds of electromagnetic radiation over and beyond visible light so bees for example can see ultraviolet sunlight reflected on flowers and that enables bees to find the flowers so they can actually uh, collect pollen uh, snakes pythons on the right hand side uh, can see infrared if you think about it um, our bodies are hot and heat generates infrared and so snakes can see um, creatures like ourselves and other hot-blooded animals by detecting infrared uh, radiation so this chart revisits the electromagnetic spectrum and what I've put on the top of it um, are the kinds of electromagnetic radiation different kinds of astronomical objects emit so when we build telescopes and specifically space telescopes uh, we may design them for looking for particular kinds of objects so for example if we're looking for exoplanets um, we may be designing the telescope to look at infrared uh, and visible uh, light whereas on the other hand if we're looking at pulsars uh, we may be looking for radio waves and gamma rays so often space telescopes may be designed to detect particular kinds of electromagnetic radiation so the research can focus on particular kinds of astronomical object so what I want to discuss now really is well, why do we send telescopes into space obviously it takes a lot more time to build a space telescope and a lot more money uh, the James Webb for example has been in development for over 20 years this chart shows the reason uh, on earth we can see visible light uh, but even that visible light can get distorted by the atmosphere on earth we also have radio telescopes because we can detect radio waves uh, on earth however most of the other kinds of waves gamma rays x-rays ultraviolet infrared uh, and so on are blocked by the earth's atmosphere and so if we want to look at objects and emit those kind of uh, 
types of electromagnetic radiation, we actually have to go to space, and that's why we launch space telescopes. So we see then, depending on the kind of astronomical objects that the astronomer wants to look at, uh, we will design the space telescope appropriately. So if we look at Hubble, uh, it was primarily a visual light telescope, but it also detects uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, specifically IR, infrared, and UV, ultraviolet. The next few slides um, give examples of some key space telescopes that have been launched over the years. Some of them are no longer function. Uh, some of them are still uh, functioning perfectly well and have been around for a number of years. So on this chart, we, we show examples of the Compton, Chandra, um, and XMM Newton space telescopes. Uh, the first two were launched by NASA. The third one was no launched by the European Space Agency. And as we see, you know, two of them uh, are sp specialised in detecting X-ray sources. Uh, the Compton one at the top is specialises in capturing uh, gamma ray data. And on the right hand side of these charts, I show the kinds of uh, object these telescopes have detected. So for example, if we look at the X-ray telescope from the European Space Agency at the bottom, we see that it's detected pulsars in the Andromeda galaxy, which is our, the galaxy that's closest to, to the Milky Way. And this chart shows further examples, um, shows examples of two space telescopes that detected ultraviolet rays. Um, one interesting one um, is on the top right hand side. I mentioned the OAO observatory launched in 1968. That was the first to discover that um, comets have large halos of hydrogen gas around them. Um, an exciting telescope was Kepler, uh, which actually was in existence for about nine years. It discovered over 2,000 potential exoplanets. In fact, these potential exoplanets uh, can provide candidates for, in fact, the James Webb telescope to look at in more detail. Uh, Kepler was a visual light telescope, uses techniques like I mentioned, as a planet goes round a, a star, um, it can actually dim the light and the space telescope can look at that dimming. And that's how uh, Kepler detected many of these exoplanets. We'll see in a minute that the James Webb telescope is specifically designed to detect infrared rays, electro magnetic waves um, and it carries on the legacy of very well-known space telescopes that detect IR radiation of Spitzer and Herschel and really what James Webb will do it will continue uh, that work um, I show another one here the European Space Agency the Planck Space Observatory, which looked for microwaves when the Big Bang occurred billions of years ago. Um, basically, uh, microwaves were emitted throughout the universe. And in fact, the Planck uh, Observatory uh, was an observatory that enables us to confirm the fact the Big Bang did occur by examining the microwave background radiation uh, in the universe. So that was just a few examples of, of some fairly well-known space telescopes. Uh, this chart is, is an eye chart. It shows uh, many of the space telescopes that exist. It also shows uh, Earth-facing telescopes, which, which are used for monitoring Earth, weather satellites, uh, satellites that really look at the effect of climate change on, on our planet. And on the left-hand side, you see the kinds of electromagnetic radiation each of these telescopes detects. At the bottom, uh, we show future missions. And as you can see, there's a considerable number of telescopes planned for the future to uh, use the experience of existing telescopes to gather more and more information. So let's start looking at James Webb. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, as I mentioned, is primarily an infrared telescope, and I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, I did discuss how Hubble was primarily a visual light telescope, but did 
uh, collect some infrared data as shown on this chart. But as we've seen here, James Webb uh, captures a, a, a wide range of different kinds of infrared frequencies and wavelengths. So this chart shows why we build infrared telescopes. It shows the, the advantage of infrared telescopes. One advantage of infrared is it will penetrate dust and gas, making more detail visible. A visual light telescopes, um, really that dust and gas will block a lot of the information. But if we move to an IR type of telescope, we can see a lot more detail here. And as we see, this is the Hubble uh, images of the Eagle Nebula. The one on the left is a visual image and the one on the right is an infrared image. And as you can see, we, we see a lot more detail there. I think it's worth mentioning that the images telescopes collect, space telescopes collect. Uh, another final ones that we see, um, scientists use a process called force color imaging. They actually color the images space telescopes see. Uh, they do that primarily to, to bring out the kind of information they're looking for. But of course, the benefit to, to us as, as the public, we see some spectacular images and Hubble's most probably collected more spectacular images than any other space telescope that's gone before it. I always enjoy talking to this slide because it demonstrates how a telescope is a time machine. The size of the universe is vast and it takes time for visual light or other forms of electromagnetic radiation to reach the Earth. There's a finite speed to the speed of light. And so when a distant object emits light, it takes time for us to reach us. So for example, the light we see from the sun, which is 93 million miles away, takes 8.3 minutes to reach us. So when we see that light, it was as the sun appeared 8.3 minutes ago. Our nearest star, Alpha Centauri, um, is 4.3 light years away. That means it takes light 4.3 years to reach Earth. So we're seeing Alpha Centauri as it was 4.3 years ago. Our nearest galaxy is Andromeda. That's two and a half million light years away, which means it takes light two and a half million years to reach us. So when we go out with, say, a pair of binoculars and look at the Andromeda galaxy, the light we see actually left Andromeda two and a half million years ago. We're going back in time and seeing what Andromeda looked like two and a half million years ago. That's kind of difficult to, to get your mind around, but this chart very clearly shows how a telescope enables us to look back in time. I mentioned the Big Bang on an earlier slide. Astronomers believe that the universe as we know it today began some 13.8 billion years ago in a single event that we call the Big Bang. And over the last 13.8 billion years, the universe has been growing and space has been expanding. And if we look at that time period, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, that's when the first galaxies and stars formed. And some nine billion years after the Big Bang, that's when our solar system formed, including planet Earth. And then some 10 million billion years after the Big Bang, that's when life on Earth began. And so during that time, a lot of the objects we've been discussing formed. And one key objective of the James Webb is look to, go, to look back in time to some 200 million years after the Big Bang, when the first galaxies and stars formed, to understand how they formed and how they've evolved since that period in time. So the Big Bang occurred about 13.8 billion years ago, and it takes a long time for light from that era to reach us. Um, one interesting thing during that time is, of course, space has expanded. And what you find is, um, as objects emit electronic ma magnetic radiation, um, as that space it 
as space expands that the wavelength that radiation gets stretched and in fact um, it may start off as visible light but it actually gets the wavelength gets stretched and so when it reaches us uh, on a space telescope like James Webb it's actually infrared light so light gets stretched to the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum as it travels through space and as space gets stretched and that is one of the reasons why the James Webb is an infrared telescope because it can look further back in time it can look back to within about 200 million years of the Big Bang so as I said telescopes are um, like time machines our ground-based observatories can look back in time to about six billion years after the Big Bang. If we take uh, fairly recent Hubble pictures, uh, it can look back to about 570 million years after the Big Bang. But the big benefit of, of James Webb is it's an infrared telescope that covers a significant amount of the infrared part of the spectrum. And so we'll be able to look back in time to about 200 million years after the Big Bang to look at really and understand how our universe evolved. Let's now drill into the Webb Space Telescope in, in, in more detail. Um, it's often viewed by NASA as a successor to the Hubble telescope, it's not a replacement for it. Hubble was very much a visual light telescope, whereas James Webb is very much an infrared telescope, but it is the largest telescope ever built. It was built by, with a joint project between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. This chart shows the various components of the Webb telescope and the launch vehicle that will be used to launch uh, the Webb into space. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope orbits the Earth in a low Earth orbit. Um, Webb is a bit different because it's an infrared telescope and the heat of the Earth um, and other objects near Earth can affect the infrared signals that Webb de detects. So we move it way further out in, into space, about a, a, a million miles away. So it isn't affected by the heat of Earth. It has a very large primary mirror much bigger than and, and Hubble's and that mirror will be used to detect um, infrared signals. To protect it uh, from objects like the Sun it has a five layer Sun shield so in fact Webb will orbit um, around the Sun it will be pointed away from the Earth, Sun and Moon so light doesn't affect it it will point straight out to space and there will be uh, a hot side pointing towards the sun um, and the five layer sun shield will protect it from the heat of objects like the sun. The cold side will be close to absolute zero so we need it to be very cold to efficiently detect infrared signals. Webb is so big um, that there's no, there's no spacecraft on earth that could launch it so it has to be folded up inside a spacecraft and then the spacecraft launches it and it, then it will deploy over a period of time but even folded up it requires a very large uh, rocket to launch it the rocket that will be used um, is the Ariane 5 it's a Euro European Space Agency rocket and this rocket will be launched uh, from French Guiana which is near the equator in South America this chart shows a few more details about the web. It actually has four instruments on it to, to capture images. And it will also uh, capture a spectra of astronomical objects. A spectra is the way we um, collect a signal and break it out into its individual components. So we can take light, for example, and break it out into the various colors that we see often in the sky of the rainbow. And so, Webb does actually look at the spectra uh, of many astronomical objects as well as collecting um, regular images using a regular camera. And there are four kinds of instrument on Webb designed for different frequencies uh, to capture different kinds of electromagnetic infrared radiation. It will be able to do some visual 
uh, observing specifically in the red and yellow parts of the visible spectrum. Webb has four main objectives and so we use these various instruments that I've briefly mentioned to carry out these objectives. I've said you know, number one priority is to look back in, in time to 200 million years after the Big Bang so we can understand how the first galaxies formed. Another priority is to understand how those galaxies evolved over time. And as those galaxies evolved, we're interested how stars are formed, how the first stellar nurseries and planets were formed. And then lastly, uh, we're going to be using uh, Webb to look at exoplanets to actually analyze using spectra the chemical properties of planetary systems, exoplanets, for example, look at the atmosphere to see what is in the atmosphere. Is there oxygen that life could use uh, to, to evolve and so on? So these are the four main objectives from looking at the first galaxies all the way through to investigating in detail exoplanets. So this chart shows the four main scientific instruments of Webb, as you can see here. Uh, each of these instruments has cameras for taking visual images or infrared images. They have spectrographs that break, breaks electromagnetic radiation and light into colors for analysis. And it has coronagraphs that block starlight. If you've got an exoplanet going around a very bright sun, the coronagraph can be used to block the sun so the web can look at the actual exoplanet itself. This is a, a picture of the set of scientific instruments that are a part of Webb. Uh, the chart shows uh, what these, each of these instrument does. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but as you can see, you know, it looks at the chemical composition of the atmospheres of exoplanets. Uh, it can look at very distant objects near the beginning uh, of time or really the beginning of our universe 200 million years after, after the Big Bang. And each of these instruments looks at different components of the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it also, this, these instruments are also used for position pointing and guiding um, of the space telescope itself. So this chart shows how a spectrograph operates in more detail. Basically what a spectrograph does is break down, um, for example, uh, a visual light signal uh, into the various colors of the spectrum. And base, based on that spectrum, the Space Telescope can determine the kind of elements that are in the object being observed. Just to put this into sort of perspective, uh, this is the spectra of three uh, of three different planets. Uh, we can see Mars, Earth and Venus. As we see here, uh, the spectra shows us it's got carbon dioxide in, in the atmospheres of, of those three planets. But notice as we move towards uh, things, looking for things like water, only Ma Earth uh, shows a, a spectral signal for water, whereas Mars and Venus don't because they're basically dry planets. So let's take a more detailed look at Webb. As I mentioned, it has the primary mirror shown here, uh, has more collecting power than, or collecting area than, than um, Hubble does, something like six and a quarter times more collecting area. And it has a much wider field of view. Um, so these various elements of the mirror are folded up inside the spacecraft and once the uh, spacecraft is launched and the uh, space telescope leaves the spacecraft, then these mirrors will gradually uh, open to form the full primary mirror. I also mentioned that Webb has a sunshade. It's about the size of a tennis court, and that's to protect the instruments being affected from heat, specifically the sun. So that shield 
It's going to be very hot on one side, but it enables the telescope to operate at close to absolute zero. So this picture shows a, 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 an image of the sun shield in, in more detail. Um, it's quite large, as you can see, if you look at the person down on the bottom left hand side, that's a huge sun shield. It's five layers. And in the same way that the mirror has to open after the space telescope has, has been launched, the same is true of the um, sun shield. It must actually expand into its five separate layers once the space telescope has been launched. So you can see this is a fairly complex operation and there are many things that could potentially go wrong. But um, as we see, it's a five layer sun shield and its objective is to maintain the instruments on the web at close to absolute zero. So this chart shows what happens to web after it's launched from Earth. It takes 29 days to reach the point in space where it orbit. Uh, that distance is about a million miles away and it's going to orbit around something called a Lagrange point. And in fact, it's, this is known as the L2 Lagrange point where um, web will orbit the sun. Uh, a Lagrange point, and there are several of them, um, are points in space where the gravity of the Earth and Sun can tend to cancel each other out. And the advantage of that for a, a space telescope that wants to orbit is the amount of energy required to keep it in orbit is much lower because the effect of gravity is lower. And so there are two advantages of pushing it out to a million miles away. One is it gets away from the heat of Earth, but secondly, the effect of gravity is fairly minimal and so therefore it requires less power uh, to actually keep it in orbit. At the time I recorded this presentation, uh, the Webb telescope uh, had arrived on a container ship. Um, it was shipped from California through the Panama Canal to the European Space Agency spaceport in French Guiana, which is on the west coast of, of South America. One of the advantages of, of using French Guiana for, for launching uh, rockets is that the Earth is spinning and rockets launch near the equator get a slight assist from the momentum of that spin of the Earth. At the current time, um, the uh, telescope is going through testing to make sure everything is still functioning OK after its journey from California. We see a folded up version of the telescope on the right hand side. Once that testing is complete, it will be put onto uh, an Arian rocket and the actual launch date for Webb at the current time is scheduled to be December 22nd. So let's keep our fingers crossed that that schedule holds. This is what the, the Arian 5 looks like on the right hand side. Uh, this is a picture from December when the first stage was actually um, put into a vertical position for the first time. Uh, it has two solid rocket boosters to, to enable it to escape Earth's gravity. And then it has a second stage that contains the actual telescope. The uh, second stage will, will launch it beyond Earth. And then the telescope has power to actually take itself on its 29 day, 1 million mile journey to the L2 Lagrange point. So that brings me to, to the end of the my presentation. Um, I think the James Webb Space Telescope is, is really exciting. It's been 20 years in, in development. Um, what I've discussed is really how that development has used the experience of earlier space telescopes, uh, how it focuses on the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, because it wants to go back further in time than any other space telescope has gone before to look at the early universe, how galaxies and stars evolve over time, but also come closer to home to look at other stars in the Milky Way galaxy and to look at exoplanets uh, around those stars to see if they're capable of supporting life by analyzing their atmospheres and, and so on. So an exciting time. Uh, we're all looking forward to the web launch. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, as always, I'd like to thank NASA. My role as a solar system ambassador would not be possible without them. Uh, they give me access to, to scientists. They give me lots of material. 
and that in turn enables me to do outreach programs like this. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it useful.